Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, ringing out 2023 with a fantastic box of historical recordings from Australian eloquence. Cyrus Mayor Humji, hey, Cy, how you doing? Happy New Year, has put together an astonishing collection on 21 CDs of historical recordings, some of which have been issued before, some of which have not. And there are names you haven't heard of and all kinds of nifty repertoire and sound is historical, but it's Deca, the history of Decca as an orchestral label. Um, and boy, is there some nifty stuff in here. There really is. It's just great. Um, uh, let's see, what do we got here? Well, let me just read the description on the back to whet your appetite. 21 conductors in a feast. It's a feast, a fiesta of classical recordings from Decca's early years, 1929 to 1949, including the golden age of its FFRR technology, newly remastered from the best available sources by Mark Obert Thorne, Ward Marston, and Andrew Halifax. This comprehensively annotated and richly illustrated set features several new to CD releases as well as previously unpublished Material. It is a must-have for any collector of historical recordings. Now, usually, I am amused at the bullshit of the puffery that's written on labels, but boy, is this true. I mean, this is it. I mean, if you like historical recordings, your ship has come in. Let me just tell you what's on here. Now, you know historical recordings. The remasterings are very well done, I have to say. And I'm astonished at how well some of the early recordings have come up from like 1929 or whatever, 1930s. Yes, at the climaxes, you hear nothing. I mean, they just clog up and the dynamic range is smushed down and, you know, we'll, we'll get to that. But in soft moments, they sound lovely. They're beautiful and really perfectly listenable. So I, and people who love historical recordings don't really care about those things anyway, so. So here's the booklet. You get the nice booklet with the nice notes and you know, descriptions of all of the conductors and their recordings. It's a beautiful, beautiful note. And we are going to go through all 21 CDs. Are you ready? <clears throat> yes, this should be a something for the new year to get you going, to get you caught up on recorded history. Let's put it that way. Disc one. Oh, you know what? They don't have dates here. So, well, they do have dates. Okay, they're tiny. Oh, my goodness. Wait a minute. Magnifying glass. Mm -hmm. This is, this is, uh, yeah, okay, there we go. It has a little light thing attached to it as well. Yeah, oh, this is helpful. Okay, you ready? Delius's Sea Drift with Roy Henderson, the New English Symphony Orchestra, uh, under Anthony Bernard. Household name, right? From 1929. Wow. Amazing. And it sounds, I mean, you know, if you like sea drift, you'll be able to get through it. Let's put it that way. Walton conducts, oh no, he's not conducting Walton. He's conducting Walton later. We get the Portsmouth Point Overture, also with Anthony Bernard. Boy, does it sound kind of like a mess. Oh God. And then Facade, eight numbers from it, I think, or 10 numbers from it. Yeah, 10 numbers from it. Not the whole thing. With Edith Sitwell and Constant Lambert, the composer and critic and author reciting, doing the recitation. I, I, I find it hard to understand a lot of it, frankly, but the accent is fun. The delivery is adorable. And then we've got the concerto for viola and orchestra, the viola concerto with Frederick Riddle, the London Symphony, and William Walton. So that's disc one, only disc one. Now you've got to remember, in its early life, Decca was a, a British label a local British label. And you can see as the years go on, Decca becoming an international powerhouse. And that's part of the fun of this collection, frankly. Hamilton Hardy conducting. Yeah, we have Walton's first symphony. Oh my goodness. And it's a very exciting performance, but like, you know, at the climax, there's like no cymbals and tam tam and the timpani or these things just didn't record. That was from, let's see, what's the date on that one? 1936. Haydn 95, a surprisingly good performance that only takes 15 minutes. No repeats anywhere. But my goodness, it's it's very quick. The minuet just flies and it's, it's rather exciting. And it's the symphony that's the least popular of the London symphonies. And he really, he, he gives it a good go. I'm impressed. And Berlioz, let's see, the King Lear Overture and the Trojan March, 
all fun stuff. It really is. And this is with the London Symphony. Disc three. More Hamilton Hardy and Sir Henry Wood. We have Hardy doing his, his let's see, a suite in five movements of Handel stuff um, that he arranged. It's very pretty. It's just pretty. Purcell, suite in five movements. Purcell things. And then also, let's see, Vaughn Williams. Now, now we're, we're up to, let's see, that was Hamilton Hardy. The Purcell is Henry Wood. And Vaughn Williams is Henry Wood. The Fantasia on Green Sleeves, the Wasps Overture, and the world's fastest performance of a London symphony. It just flies by in 36 minutes. It's like, of course, the climax. No cymbals, no tam-tam, nothing. But my God, they play it so quickly. He, you know, he, people say that a lot of it had to do with you know, the length of a 78 RPM side, and so they had to sort of squish it in. And that may have been a factor in some of these performances. But also, they just didn't care. There was a different standard of orchestral execution back then, really. I mean, George Sell talked about it. Until Toscanini went on a European tour with the New York Philharmonic in the 1930s and played Beethoven Seventh, and everybody went, <laughs> There were standards of orchestral execution were just sloppier and playing things faster than the orchestra could comfortably handle was rather common. It wasn't a big deal. Um, you know, so there you go. Disc four, more Henry Wood, Eric Coates, the London Suite and the London Bridge March and the Elgar Enigma variations in 25 minutes. <whistles> yeah. And let's see what else have we got here. We have Albert Coates, my goodness, Albert Coates made lots of acoustic recordings, and some of them were like the fastest, fastest Mozart Jupiter Symphony I ever heard in my life. It was like dump it dump it dump da 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 bump it dump it dump da 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 yump it dump bump it dump bump it dump bump bump it dump bump. I loved listening to those; they were hysterically funny. But he was Russian, actually, Albert Coates, and and he's doing let's see the Bach two violin concerto, um, and the the Gluck overture to Alceste in the Wagner version, I assume. Oh, that's, wait a minute. Those are with Mengelberg, pardon me. Those are Mengelberg recordings. Okay, and then we've got Albert Coates, after I talked about Albert Coates. Well, Mengelberg, we know who he was, right? Um, he's with, this is with the Gezerkabal, both of these. Um, so that's fine. And then we've got A Night on Bald Mountain and the Go Pack from Sorochinsky Fair with the London Symphony and Albert Coates. There's Albert. There's Albert. And we've got um, Snigorochka, the snow maid, the dance of the tumblers. Oh, I love the dance of the tumblers. Da 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 ba 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 da da. That's just marvelous. And then we've got uh, two bits of the the Coq d'Or suite, uh, the bridal procession and the introduction. Not in that order. Tchaikovsky sixth, and Romeo and Juliet. Boy, this is a long disc, and these are all at relatively normal tempos. You'd be perhaps disappointed to learn. So those are fun, with various orchestras and things. Victor de Sabata, the legendary. Victor de Sabata, the guy who even intimidated Toscanini. You've got the Eroica. Is it a good Eroica? Well, eh, it's nothing. Uh, Berlioz, Roman Carnival, Sibelius, Vals Triest, Wagner, Ride of the Valkyries, all with a London Phil. You know, de Sabata made very few recordings. He was an incredible perfectionist, self-lacerating perfectionist. And I find these performances to be okay. And that's it. Legendary, mystical, yeah, nope. Then we've got more Victor de Sabata and Roger de Zormier, who's more interesting to me than Victor de Sabata because of his repertoire. So de Sabata does On Saga by Sibelius, a very long, slow performance, 19 minutes and 23 seconds. Um, it, it really, it's, I find it rather limp. This is with the London Phil, which was nothing special in those days. Um, then we've got, let's see, Bizet, the Overture Patri. Oh, that's really bizarre. And his Jeu d'Enfant and the Habanera by Chabrier and Debussy's March Ecossais with the National Symphony Orchestra and Des Ormières. And then we've got, let's see, oh, Janine Michaud, wonderful French soprano singing bits of Gounod from Romeo and Juliet. Je veux vivre, you know, the waltz thing. And let's see, Offenbach, uh, the, uh, let's see, Les Oiseaux dans la Charmi from the Tales of Hoffman and and bits of Gounod Mireille and Ambroise Thomas's Mignon and Heinrich Prosch 
uh, some song thing. And Charpentier's Depuis le Jour with the Paris Conservatoire. What are the dates of this thing? Uh, 48, 1948, 49. So we're sort of into that era. <clears throat> Gregor Fittelberg. I mean, he did quite a few recordings here, and here they are. Uh, Wagner's Meister Singer, Tchaikovsky, Piano Concerto Number 2. Grossly cut. They got through it in 31 minutes with Eileen Joyce. This is in the Eileen Joyce box, by the way, that Eloquence also issued. And Tchaikovsky's Third Symphony, also cut especially the finale, um, and uh, with the London Philharmonic. So what, what sense do you get of him as a conductor, a Polish conductor? Um, not, well, you know, it depends how you respond. You listen to the music as if um, you don't know what it really is supposed to sound like, and you'll enjoy it. The, the piano concerto is missing its final chords as well, which is probably why they never issued it. Um, then we've got Bored and Polovtsian Dances, or Polovtsian Dances, however you want to pronounce it. And... Uh, the Tsar Sultan Suite. Well, these are lovely. They're fun. Brahms, too, with Fort Wengler. Well, that's a, a known commodity. It's an extremely mediocre Brahms, too. Um, but Fort Wengler apparently liked the sound. There you go. Uh, Carlo Zecchi and Piero Coppola. Disc 10. Rossini, La Scala di Seta. Oh, I love that overture. It's so much fun. Pizzetti, the suite from La Pisanella and Beethoven's fourth piano concerto with Clara Haskell and the London Phil, all with Carlo Zecchi. Now that's fun, isn't it? And then we've got the Greek symphonic dances with Piero Coppola. See, I like the interesting repertoire, even in grotty sound. I really do because, you know, we've heard so much of the other stuff and so many of these historical recordings just don't measure up, you know, but in, in less popular repertoire, well, you know, we can first of all be more forgiving, and second of all, there's less competition. So what have we got here? Where were these? 48, 49, 50. There you go. Let's see who we got here. More Piero Coppola. Um, Schumann First Symphony, the Spring Symphony with the National Symphony Orchestra, a lively zippy performance, and the Schumann Second with Inescu conducting. That's a well-known commodity. Um, it's also a, a, a Fairly lithe and nimble performance that's fun to listen to again. Um, Inescu didn't make that many recordings. Ulcerme. Okay, well, Ulcerme has a mono box coming out. These will be in the mono box. But here they are. You've got the Debussy Petite Suite and La Mer. These are from, from let's see, uh, 48 and 49. Some of them with the, the Orchestra de la Suisse Romande, while well, the La Mer is anyway, and Ravel's Alborada del Grazioso, and then Scheherazade and Laval's with the Paris Conservatoire, which is always fun to listen to. As a matter of course, even when they sound kind of grotty, which they sometimes do, but not here. They're, they're really good. Clemens Krauss and Paul van Kempen. I mean, isn't this like, it's a conductor's gallery. Isn't it cool? I mean, don't you just love it? It's just nifty. Clemens Krauss, the Fidelio Overture, Brahms Academic Festival, Richard Strauss, Death and Transfiguration, and Till Eulenspiegel's Lustiger Strecher. Those, of course, have been issued before. There's a Clemens Krauss box out there somewhere. Um, and then, of course, Pirates and things like that. And then Paul Van Kempen doing Wagner's Tannhäuser and, and Fliegen the Hollander things, Overtures, um, with the Orchestra of La Scala with Van Kempen. Well, that's interesting. And also the Till Eulenspiegel's with the La Scala Orchestra. That's fun. That's something different. Um, and the others are the London Symphony and the London Phil, you know, the usual culprits. Disc 14, Malcolm Sargent doing Handel. Yes. Of course, Malcolm Sargent was the English Oratorio Festival Choral Conductor par excellence. Um, and we have here, let's see. Well, the important thing is that the soloist in some of these pieces in Ombre My Fu, let's put it that way, and, and also uh, an aria from Rhoda Linda, was Kathleen Ferrier. Of course, those are famous from Kathleen Ferrier. But a lot of these choruses were apparently never issued. Like even the Hallelujah Chorus and Zadok the Priest and some other stuff. And you get some alternative takes and whatnot. They're being released for the first time. So so Malcolm Sargent, England, English choral, Kathleen Ferrier, alternate take choral fans will find this fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I wasn't fascinated. It is what it is. You know, it was fun to listen to. More Malcolm Sargent doing more Handel and Gustav Holst, the perfect full ballet music. Well, that's been kicking around for a bit. 
And then we've got, let's see, we've got Edward von Bynum with his Concertgebouw thing in, in Britain and the London Symphony doing Elgar and Malcolm Arnold. Yeah, I love von Bynum. He was always great. We've got Elgar's Calcania Overture and the Britain Four C Interludes from Peter Grimes and the Passacaglia and Malcolm Arnold's Beckus the Dandy Prat. Cool, huh? Yeah, with with the Concertgebouw playing playing. No, it's the London Phil doing Elgar and Arnold. Yes, and the Concertgebouw doing the Britain thing. They're, those are very well known performances. Uh, let's see, because some of them were on Phillips, and you know it's Decca now, so. Technically, I think it wasn't actually Decca. Um, this is not a Decca thing from Decca's great history of whatever when it was with the Concerto Bell, but who's complaining, right? And more Edward von Beide Mahler, Songs of a Wayfarer with Eugenia Zareska and Bruckner Seven um, with the Concerto Bell. I mean, this Bruckner was always marvelous, swift and wonderful and cohesive and beautiful, and I, you just love it, you know. Uh, who have we got now? Oh, Knoppert's Bush. Okay, well, these are these are we all know. This is you know Wagner stuff, right? The Rienzi Overture, Tannhäuser Overture, and Venusberg music, Lohengrin's Preludes Act One and Three, and Meistersinger stuff. Preludes Act One and Three, Dance of the Apprentices, March of the Guilds, with the London Phil, the Tone Hollow Orchestra of Zurich, the Orchestra de la Suisse Romande, with you know Knoppert's guy, yes, Der Kna as he was known in Deutsch. Okay, Eric Kleiber, also very well-known stuff. Um, Handel's Andante Larghetto from Berenice and Mozart's 40th and Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony, all with the London Phil. Um, I mean, how many Kleiber boxes have there been? I think I have one sitting right over here somewhere. And yeah, it's, it's, it's around, you know. That's very well-known. More Eric Kleiber. Um, Strauss Waltz's Dvorak's Carnival Overture with the London Phil. It's a terrible Carnival Overture. Uh, well, I mean, sonically, you can't don't hear anything. And let's see, what have we got here for the rest of it? Uh, Jean Martinon, Tchaikovsky. We've got, um, let's see, what is this thing? We've got uh, some song thing. What is that? With Eugenia Zareska, mezzo-soprano. Yeah, okay. Um, oh, Chasse Nostal, Prostitia V, Call Me, Polia, Rodnia, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, then we've got, let's see, oh, The Sweet Pastoral by Chabrier and the Tombeau de Couperin, all with the London Phil and Jean Martinon at the beginning of his career. When, when were these? 1948, 1949, somewhere in there. Yeah, 1949 is as far as we get, so. Um, then we've got Leo Blech. Yes, with the orchestra de la Suisse Romande doing Haydn's Surprise, the Surprise Symphony, and the prelude from Hansel and Gretel by Humperdinck, and then Celebedaki. Celebedaki doing Mozart's 25th Symphony, and forgettably, and Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker Suite and Symphony Number no. 5, also with the London Phil and Celebedaki. Um, not special. What can I tell you? So, but there you go. I mean, it's not about how good the performances are. It really isn't. Because these are historical collector's items. They are significant merely because they exist, not because they're any good. That's how historical recordings generally are evaluated, isn't it? It's about how historical they are, not how wonderful they are. But, of course, there are a lot of wonderful historical recordings. You can get both. But in a box like this, the idea is to simply provide a... A, a overview of Decca the label for the period 1929 to 1949, and that's exactly what we get. And there's some really remarkable stuff and some less remarkable stuff, as you might expect, but collectors aren't going to care. You're going to want it. It's a collector's item. So start collecting. You should ring out 2023 with a collection that looks back over the past bazillion years, because as of tomorrow, we're looking forward Onward, upward, etc. Ad Astra, Per Ardua, and all of that crap. There you go. So, Happy New Year. Keep on listening, friends. Take care. <laughs>